Um, so we're going to start the official kickoff for our event now. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Tanya Tolker. I am one of the co-directors of MIT Hacking Medicine. And along with my two other co-directors, Stephanie Hu and Tianji Kim, we would like to officially welcome you to the kickoff of the first ever virtual MIT Grand Hack hosted by MIT Hacking Medicine. So while we all know that this year has been quite a wild ride for everyone, it has resulted in a lot of innovation in the healthcare space and um, opportunities to collaborate between many diverse sets of individuals. And we're excited to continue this this weekend. In addition, we're extremely grateful to have this time and space to be able to share with all of you who are attending Grand Hack this year, and also to have gotten the opportunity to expand our participant and mentor pool to include people from all around the world and a bunch of different time zones. This year is our biggest Grand Hack yet, with over 700 participants and over 120 mentors. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming here tonight and for this weekend. I'd like to also thank the MIT Hacking Medicine team for working tirelessly over the last few weeks and the past few months to port over our in-person event to a virtual event, as well as all of our sponsors displayed here who have been very accommodating while shifting over to the virtual event and have put together an amazing set of challenges for our participants. These challenges form the initial questions that can be used to ideate problems within the four tracks that we have. Most of you um, participants have been assigned to one of these tracks already. So we have customized cancer care, digital clinical measures of activity, future of aging, and access to healthcare during COVID-19. Um, we would also like to emphasize that the majority of our communications are going to take place over Slack. So I would like to take this time right now to be able to um, have everyone who is a participant or a mentor on board onto Slack. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes if you haven't already. Uh, get familiar with the workspace. We have a channel for general announcements that will be used to broadcast things about, for example, links to um, workshops as well as to other events that we have over the weekend. Any questions that you would like to ask the organizers can be asked within the channel for questions for organizers. And we also have a layout of the Slack channels, which is provided in the participant handbook. In addition, um, I, most of the questions that you might encounter over the weekend, um, we have tried to answer all of them within our participant handbook and our participant portal. So you can access that by going to grandhack.mit.edu slash boston slash portal. The password is here and is also included in a lot of our communications on Slack, and it has the link to all of the resources for the event. So we encourage you to look there really quickly if you do have a question, um, and if you're unable to find the information, definitely ping us on Slack and we'll make sure to get that information to you as quickly as possible. So I'll just wait for a couple of minutes um, for anyone who hasn't onboarded onto Slack yet, and then we'll resume the presentation afterwards.
All right. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, hopefully, everyone is able to get onto Slack and um, understand generally how the whole workspace works, and we'll make sure to also clarify things if needed. So just to give you a brief overview of how the next hour or so is going to go, um, we're going to first start off with keynotes from the representatives of our gold sponsors who have been sponsoring our main tracks as well as a cross track prize. And after that, I'll go over a brief overview of what an MIT Hacking Medicine Hackathon looks like and what you can expect for the upcoming weekend. So our first keynote is from Bill Siebold, who is an executive vice president and head of Sanofi Genzyme, the specialty care global business unit of Sanofi. In this role, he is a member of the Sanofi Executive Committee. Previously, Bill was the global head of Sanofi Genzyme's multiple sclerosis, oncology, and immunology franchises, and led the preparation for the launches of two important new immunology treatments. Bill joined Sanofi Genzyme in 2011 as senior vice president and head of multiple sclerosis and oversaw the successful launches of its two MS treatments. As head of Sanofi Genzyme, he leads the business's efforts to maintain its leadership in rare diseases while continuing to grow in multiple sclerosis, oncology, and immunology. Bill has had more than 25 years of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry since starting his career with Eli Lilly. He held a number of leadership positions at Biogen, including driving their US commercial operations in neurology, oncology, and rheumatology, and general management of Biogen's Australian and Asia Pacific business. In addition to his time with Biogen, Bill also served as chief commercial officer of Avenir Pharm Pharmaceuticals. Bill holds an MBA from Harvard Business School and a BA in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale University. I'll let Bill take it over. Great, can you see me okay? Can you hear me? Yep, we can all hear you and see you. Good, that's great. I was having some problems a little bit earlier in this new virtual world. Uh, so first of all, you know, thank you for the great introduction, Tanya. Uh, on behalf of myself, Sanofi and Sanofi Genzyme, I'd like to welcome everyone to day one of the MIT Hacking Medicine Grand Hack. It is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first time, so I'm uh, quite excited. And, you know, MIT's medicine's mission to energize entrepreneurship and digital strategies to take on health problems around the world really closely aligns with the commitment that we have as a company. So I feel very aligned and, and happy to be here. I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time uh, tonight because I know there's a lot of exciting things that you are looking forward to. But I did want to make a couple of uh, introductory remarks and perhaps set a little bit of context, a little bit of tone, and just give you my thoughts having uh, lived in the innovative ecosystem uh, for essentially my whole career. And you know, I've been in, uh, as you heard from my bio, I've been in the biopharmaceutical industry my whole career, and I truly believe that this is the greatest industry in the world. Every day we have an opportunity to save and transform lives. And that is something which not many other industries, if any other industry, really has the opportunity to do. And you know, that's for me certainly what drives me. And the way that we have that ability to have that potential impact on people, it's, it's simply through innovation. You know, it's from scientific breakthroughs that happen in our labs or it can be as simple as a new digital tool to help people manage their conditions. And sometimes as we think about what innovation is to help people, we think it has to be a curative medicine. But there are so many things that can make the journey better for somebody along the way because it is a long complicated journey. Now, I will, uh, uh, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking to you about uh, just some of the, the context which we are uh, working in these days. It is uh, pretty daunting, some of the challenges that we face. But, you know, uh, let me, let me uh, I'm going to come back to this, but let me start by saying it is great to be October. I love when the calendar transitions into October every year. And I'm going to come back to that uh, in a minute. It's not only for this event, but it's for other reasons as well. But as I was saying, the 
there are some pretty daunting challenges uh, facing us. Everything from the burden of the diseases that we have face uh, as uh, society, uh, cancer being one of them, and one of the biggest challenges that uh, we're going to be talking about uh, during the course of uh, uh, this conference. But as a company, it's something that we're focused on. And it's getting particularly challenging as we increase the age of the population, there is more likelihood that people will be exposed to and deal with cancer on a personal basis. Now, if I was asking the people that are uh, tuning in this evening, to raise your hands if you have had any personal association with cancer, either with yourself, a friend, or a loved one, I would have to believe, although I can't see out there, that there would be almost every hand in this crowd going up. And that is a big challenge. And it's going to, I think, become a bigger challenge for us, and it's going to create a lot of strains on societies, and it will actually start to begin to challenge the sustainability of the healthcare system, which is something that the world's grappling with right now for a number of reasons. Some of those I'll come back to, but that it's something that as a, from my perspective, an industry we have to deal with because there isn't a lack of innovation that we've had in the industry uh, and in society of late as, it treat, as we think about cancer. You know, 20 years ago, we never would have thought that we would be able to find a way to harness the body's natural system to fight cancer from the inside out. And this is the whole field of immuno-oncology that has risen. And it's really quite amazing that we're starting to see some of the results in some of the almost impossible to treat cancers by using our own body, body harnessing our own power. Now, it's, it's advanced so far that now we're looking at ways to try to understand what is causing resistance to immunotherapy. So what's the underlying mechanism that we can now make the tumor receptive so that we can make use of the uh, immuno-oncology therapies that we have today? So as I look to the future, we're going to have uh, the expectations of what is possible, not only to have your body wage its war against cancer, but also if your body's getting in the way of that, what do we do to overcome that next hurdle? And you're gonna see this uh, continuous refining to get to better, more effective, safer medications to help people. Really quite amazing. Now, precision medicine as well as something which is coming along. And as we grow to understand the biology of the disease, and that for me really is where this all starts from innovation. If you understand the biology, you can apply new technologies that will allow us to get closer and closer to finding the optimal cure for an individual patient or a group of patients. And it's something which we're always going to be in the race of the biology, the analytics, the access to data in the community, merging them all together and creating outcomes that can matter. Now, again, this is more on the tech piece of things, but we have to remember that in order for a patient to be um, uh, benefit from a therapy, they have to get the therapy. And for so long, we've had barriers of use of medicines based upon the way they're even delivered. Sometimes you have hours long IV infusions, and we are working on technologies where you can take some of those IV infusions and convert them to something like a once a day pill. I mean, talk about a way that a patient can really truly benefit from, uh, from technology. Now, of late, just to transition a little bit from uh, cancer. The industry has uh, been front and center as it relates to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, this is something that uh, our company has been heavily involved in. We have six different initiatives that are headed towards COVID-19, two vaccines. And the reason why I wanna talk about uh, this for a moment is to set up uh, really how we think about this uh, conference as well. You know. Um, during the pandemic, there has been just this remarkable uh, speed on which we have made gains to trying to understand the uh, virus and look for solutions against the virus. At last count, there were over 600 uh, individual programs that were headed towards either uh, vaccines or treatments for COVID-19. 
And one of the reasons why we've been able to move so fast is because of the collaboration that has existed across industries, across public and private, academic institutions, et cetera. And I think it's a really important and probably the most important ingredient for successful innovation is that collaboration across multiple uh, stakeholders that each holds a specific piece of information or insight that when put together can truly create something remarkable. And I think as it relates to, to COVID-19, I think there's great progress that is being made. As you uh, have uh, read the news today, some of the latest innovation has being uh, 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 attempted on uh, even the President of the United States. So I, I hold great uh, promise that we are going to get through this. And it's going to be through that um, uh, lens of, of, of collaboration that I think we're going to be able to do this. Now, we talk a lot about um, innovation and we can't lose sight of the thing that's really the most important in innovation. And that is who we're doing it for, which is the patient. You know, I talked to you, as I said earlier, that I always am happy to see October come uh, around. The reason being is September's never been a, my favorite month. Uh, when I was nine years old, I broke my leg, was in hospital for a month and then cast for six weeks. And it uh, took out my whole first, uh, first half of school. The other reason is, is that uh, uh, 33 years ago in September, uh, my mother died and she died of complications from cancer. And I can't even 33 years later not think about the whole, all the steps that we went through during that journey and ultimately her death. And now uh, it was, uh, she had uh, multiple myeloma and now there are some really, really great therapies for multiple myeloma and uh, as a company, we're working on solutions as well and have a product. And you can't underestimate, unless you've lived it yourself, obviously, the impact that these diseases have not only on the patient but on the family and it is a all of these have to be treated for the crisis that they are you know the reason why we've made progress on covid 19 is because it is a pandemic it's a crisis everyone's affected everyone can line up we have to create a crisis-like environment as we think about approaching any of the diseases that remain for us to treat and there are a lot of them. And time is of the essence. As I said, I can't wind back the clock 33 years ago and provide the intervention that is available today. But what we can do is we can collaborate together to try to find that next unmet need and help people that are going to be uh, potentially suffering and having their uh, life cut extremely short. And it's not just the person, it's also the people that are, that are, that are all around them. So what I'll uh, leave you with, I, I don't want to take any more of your time, is uh, just again, this re-emphasis on collaboration and how important it is. You know, if we were live tonight, we would be sitting in Cambridge. That's where our headquarters are. That's where uh, MIT is. And the reason why Cambridge is the, really the center of the world for innovation in the life sciences is a lot because the ingredients are all here to put a diverse group of people together to collaborate, to create life-saving medicines and interventions. Now, we're not gonna have that full ability to sit next to each other and have that dialogue tonight, but uh, over the course of the weekend, we're gonna have a lot of opportunities to sit down and start to tackle some of the most challenging issues facing our global community today. We're gonna talk about COVID-19 and we're going to talk about other aspects of, of cancer. And you were all selected to be here because you've demonstrated that commitment to be bold, creative thinkers with a desire to shake up the status quo of the healthcare system. And that's something that we need. We've got to be out of the box. The best, I really believe that some of the best ideas are going to come from the people that aren't constrained by the uh, uh, thinking that they have in their current roles and that when you get challenged by somebody who just comes at the problem a little bit differently, I think we're gonna have the breakthrough. So I look forward to seeing what comes out of tonight 
It is a start and it is important. Never forget, if you can make an experience for the patient, for a family member, for a loved one, for a friend, better, that's innovation. That's innovation. Focus on the patient and look for results and you can make a difference. And that's what I'm asking you to think about, but don't lose sight of how important a goal that we have. So thank you in advance for uh, all that you're gonna be doing. I look forward to, to seeing what we get. And with that, I will pass the floor back. Great, thank you so much, Bill, for those inspiring words. And also um, we encourage everyone who is in the uh, customized cancer care track as well as the future of aging track to check out the challenges that have been published by Sanofi Genzyme. All right, so our next keynote is from Marilyn Newalt. She's a PhD, is a research patient advocate with the Parkinson's Foundation. She is rewired from a long and engrossing career in pediatric audiology, during which she directed audiology programs at Boston Children's Hospital and served as assistant professor of otolaryngology at Harvard Medical School. She specialized in electrophysiological measures of hearing in infants and in programming cochlear implant devices. By 2004, symptoms appeared, which were diagnosed in 2009 as Parkinson's disease. In the fall of 2016, she discovered quite by accident her new ability to compose piano music. When she retired in 2017, she joined a Parkinson's chorus and dance exercise program. Her prior experience as a clinician and researcher in a different field helps to fuel her contributions as a patient advocate on the steering committee of the Parkinson's Outcomes Project for the Parkinson's Foundation and as a member of the Health Literacy Task Force for the Multi-Regional Clinical Trial Center. Marilyn and her husband, Norm, live in Westwood, Massachusetts. They enjoy spending time online with their grandchildren in Albuquerque. We'll pass the floor on to Marilyn. All right, am I on? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, very good. I am incredibly excited to be here and wish I could be everywhere at once tomorrow, um, to, you know, hearing what the mentors have to say and what you ask them. I hope what I can do is to help you feel free to ask the mentor certain kinds of questions and free to get clarification when you're not quite certain what they meant and to set up a communication environment where they will be free to say the little extra that will help you get a great idea. So to tell you a bit of my story, and I'll, I'll tell you little bits that I think may trigger or reinforce ideas that you have of directions you can go. So in January of 2004, I was driving along the road and felt a tremor in my right hamstring. And it was odd. It wasn't like one of those little muscle twitches that you get in your eye later in a muscle that sort of ripples and goes away. It was a rhythmic tremor that was persistent. And within 30 seconds, I said to myself, well, I have Parkinson's disease. That's my future. I always wondered, everybody gets some darn thing. I always wondered what it would be. Well, by the time I got to a neurologist, which wasn't right away because I was busy and it wasn't very bothersome, um, it was diagnosed as essential tremor. This is a common story. People who have Parkinson's typically uh, do not get a correct diagnosis immediately unless they get really lucky. 
to have a primary care doctor or to get to a neurologist with specialization in movement disorders. There is no routine screen and no one set diagnostic test for Parkinson's. So bear in mind that by the time your tremor starts, which is often one of the first symptoms, the dopamine producing cells in your brain are 70 to 80% gone already by the time your tremor starts. So imagine the lost time in understanding the early biology and early treatment of this condition, which is remarkably common. I'm sorry, I'm sitting kind of tilted. Um, about every nine minutes, somebody's diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. The numbers are pushing a million in the United States and 10 million worldwide. It's more than MS, ALS, and muscular dystrophy combined. It's a lot of people. And if you think you don't know anyone with Parkinson's, you probably don't know anybody over 50. Um, because you probably know somebody who has it and doesn't know it. Well, I suppose you're wondering why I called my talk the last day I ever wore a skirt. And you're, um, and I, I guess I really should satisfy your curiosity on that one. In the fall of 2004, so mind you, let's see, it's September 2004. It's uh, eight months after the tremor started, which started in my legs. Alan Alda came to visit Boston Children's Hospital to do a piece on cochlear implants in children. Um, it was his second visit. He was following up on a cochlear implant surgery from 2001 to see how the girl was doing three years later. And at the end of his visit, we sat in a circle in the Prouty Garden, which has been absconded to become a building or a parking lot or something by now. Um, but Alan Alda and the girl and um, her parents and I were sitting in a circle in the garden and he was asking me questions and talking with the girl. And my legs had a really robust tremor that day. And I was wearing a skirt that just went to the knees. And as he asked me questions, I remember desperately trying to control my legs. I remember just how it felt when I see the video. So there was Alan Alda questioning me. I had Parkinson's and didn't yet know it because I'd been diagnosed with something else. And he was going to have Parkinson's and probably already was losing some of his dopamine producing cells. And this just seems kind of ironic to me looking back on it, that there we were talking about hearing and cochlear implants, um, sharing a much different aspect of our future. So, um, I could show you a little of this uh, video, but I won't take the time. There's some other things I, I want to cover, but I can tell you where it is if anybody wants to know. Another aspect of bringing up Alan Alda is he has an institute at Stony Brook for promoting plain language and clear communication for scientists to talk about their work with the lay population. He's very good at it, at it himself. And plain language doesn't mean imprecision. It can mean um, expansion, clarification. Um, probably some of the mentors you'll meet up with are like many of the people in my Parkinson's wellness programs, chorus, dance exercise, artist program, and so forth. It's unbelievable when you go around the room with a retired history professor, a 
pathologist, um, high school principal of this or that, um, people very accomplished. I don't know if it's just the Boston area or if these are the people who get out there and get into the wellness programs, but it's a, a ridiculously high achieving group of people. Um, so may I share the screen? Well, I guess I'll just. Yes, you should be able to go ahead and share your screen. All right. Okay. So you might think I'm going to prep you to talk with your mentors by giving you all kinds of multisyllabic words to discuss their condition, but no. This would be my file cabinet. Instead of etiology and uh, comorbidities, all those things translate into what is it? Who gets it? When? How long does it last? Or how long do I have? Or how long have I had it? How bad does it get? What else should I be worried about? I should put another shoe to drop on that drawer. How does it happen? Why does it get started? What makes it stop? So we all write scientifically a little bit differently than we converse. And I think that these experiences with the mentors will go best if you're conversational. And if one of you doesn't quite understand what the other one said, it's worth saying, wait a minute, can you rephrase that? Also, make sure that the person can hear you. If you're in a noisy environment, most of us are a little older with marginal hearing and look directly at the people and speak clearly. It cannot be emphasized enough. Let me I want to familiarize you with, if you do have a mentor with Parkinson's, with the on-off cycle of medication because it has a great deal to do with measurement of um, tremor, dyskinesia, gait, and so forth. Um, it's typical for a patient with Parkinson's to um, to feel weak and tremulous and have a tremor when they haven't taken medication for a while. They take the medication, the tremor stops, the gait, the speed of the gait picks up, speed of speaking, everything. And then it can go a little overboard into dyskinesia, which is a problem I often have, which is the writhing motions. Um, that are a side effect of medication. And then when that subsides and you become weak and tremulous, you start all over again. So here is me first thing in the morning, weak and tremulous. Hardly able to push the keys down to take my medication 40 minutes later. But then if the stars are not aligned, I get some dyskinesia. And here I am um, during a rehab stay for um, a shattered sacrum and building a marvelous architecture inside. Um, I'm at Spalding Rehab and I had just composed a song and dragged a few people to sing it with me. And you can see the dyskinesia, there's some shoulder rolling and my feet are plopping off the pedals and so forth. Wait a sec.
So when you talk about somebody's tremor, gait, dyskinesia, it has to be with respect to the state they are in with their medication. Um, there are many clinical trials and some medications to smooth out this roller coaster, but it is one of the most frustrating aspects of Parkinson's. One thing that helped me was learning to understand it I participated in a phase three clinical trial for a drug that was to reduce the depth of the off periods. Now, let me stop share here. Now, how, how was this measured? Well, we were given a little a sheet where every half hour we were to log whether we were asleep, off, on without dyskinesia, on with non-troubling dyskinesia, or on with troubling dyskinesia. And the best part of this process was at baseline, I spent a few hours with a study nurse. Every half hour, I would rate my condition. She would rate it independently, and we had to come to agreement, a concordance training. It was the most helpful thing. It was the first time I really realized these things were cyclical, and I could predict them, and it gave me much more of a feeling of control. So I can't imagine how wonderful it would be to have a wearable monitor that would give me even more information without having to log it every, uh, every 30 minutes. The sheet was ridiculous. I hadn't had my cataract taken care of at the time, and the font was ridiculously small, and you had to follow this line across. And I even made my own sheet on much stiffer paper with um, shaving guides and something I could put in my pocket. And then I would transfer it to their sheets before I'd go in for a study visit. So, um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that um, many, many studies uh, already done and in progress show the benefit of exercise for Parkinson's. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's, it's just astonishing how much better you feel if you exercise every day. But the questionnaires to record how much exercise you've had, um, oh, they're pretty lame. And you know how a lot of studies are done retrospectively by chart review to get some pilot data that you can use to submit for funding for a, a trial for a new drug or whatever. But it will say, okay, how many hours a week do you get of light exercise, moderate exercise, or strenuous exercise? Well, okay, now I think of my Parkinson's dance class. It's an hour and a half once a week, but it isn't every week. It goes seven weeks off, one week off, seven weeks off. Uh, on one week off, an occasional week might have no class because of um, a holiday or something. But we would answer the question as though it was happening every week. Some people are able to participate in all the movement that the instructor is doing, all the way to some people who are so, whose Parkinson's is so advanced that their partner moves their arms and legs for them along with the music. And some 
participate for about 20 minutes and then they're pooped and sit there enjoying the rest of the class. But we all look the same on a checkoff sheet. I would love a wearable monitor of some sort, but it would have to be strapped around my upper leg or my, my, my thigh or my upper arm. I can't imagine anywhere else that it could be, that it wouldn't get in the way. It, it can't be just in your phone. We can't carry our phones everywhere. We can't have anything in our hands when we climb the stairs because we're supposed to be holding onto the railing on both sides. Phones just aren't curved. It's very hard, especially for a female hand, to hold phones as big as they are now and hold onto the stair railing. So if, if it could be something not held, it would be absolutely wonderful. Well, I am going to stop there and I can't wait to see what you folks come up with. And I hope next year I get to be on the other side and be on a team thinking of something. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marilyn. That was that was a great keynote. Um, and so for anyone who's in the digital clinical measures of activity track, um, I'm sure Marilyn, I'm not sure if you're going to be there tomorrow, but you will get to talk to Marilyn and others um, as part of the track that's being sponsored by Diamond Pfizer. All right. So our next keynote is Lawrence Stunts. He is the director of the Massachusetts eHealth Institute at MassTech, or MAHI. He is an experienced and passionate leader working to help Massachusetts leverage digital health innovation for better economic and care delivery outcomes. Prior to joining MAHI in 2012, Lawrence worked for 225 years, I believe, sorry, in healthcare information technology product development, systems integration, and management consulting primarily focused on collaboration and exchange of information among healthcare organizations. He was a partner at Computer Sciences Corporation with responsibility for CSE's Collaborative Communities Solution Area and the Senior Vice President responsible for product development for NaviNet. Lawrence is an advocate for stronger patient engagement in healthcare information and decision-making and serves as a member of both the Massachusetts Health Information Technology Council and the Governor's Digital Health Council. He's a Dartmouth College graduate, a Wellesley resident, and an enthusiast of outdoor sports, craft beer, and his family. You can find Lawrence online at L Stunts. Lawrence, it's all you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks all and uh, thanks Tanya and thanks uh, Marilyn for that uh, nice introduction to some of the challenges uh, that you're seeing. Uh, my name is Lawrence Stunts. I am the director of uh, the Massachusetts eHealth Institute at the Mass Tech Collaborative. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are the uh, state's innovation arm uh, charged with helping to grow the digital health cluster here in the state of Massachusetts. And so uh, for many of you, regardless of uh, the track that you're on, uh, you can find resources at massdigitalhealth.org to help uh, grow your ideas once uh, this hackathon is done. And I look forward to uh, seeing all of you uh, sort of check out the resources there as well as uh, the job board, stakeholder directory, and so on. I also want to thank uh, Benchmark Senior Living. Uh, they are co-sponsoring this track uh, along with us. Uh, Benchmark provides community living for seniors uh, with a range of situations from independent living to assisted living, memory care, skilled nursing care, respite care. Uh, and together we conceived of this track uh, as, you know, to think about the future of aging. Uh, this is a key area of interest uh, for us here in the Commonwealth. And uh, we're really interested to see what you can uh, 
see what solutions come out of uh, your work this weekend. So why, why aging? Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, all of us are gonna get old and we will probably die. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, but, you know, more immediately uh, by 2030, there will be uh, all the baby boomers will be above 65 years old. Uh, and there will be about 73 million of them uh, here in the U.S. Uh, by 2033 here in the U.S., uh, there will be more people older than 65 than there are younger than 18. Uh, the fastest growing cohort of uh, any demographic uh, across the world is those who are 80 or, or more years old. So as many of you have experienced, uh, this group contains our parents, our grandparents today. And, and uh, for many people uh, at that age, it's the most likely to have significant physical or cognitive impairment. It doesn't strike everybody. And one of the things that we want to see is uh, a future where uh, folks can stay stay engaged in their communities, stay engaged with their families, stay independent and stay mobile, stay healthy uh, longer and longer. And, and we've had huge successes in uh, in those areas already, uh, and we want to see more. That's part of why we're helping to sponsor this uh, this track. So uh, for those who may not know, Massachusetts is uh, the center of aging innovation uh, in many ways. Uh, we were the second state in the U.S. and the first to join, uh, sorry, the second state in the U.S. to join AARP's Age-Friendly Network, which is affiliated with the international uh, age-friendly movement sponsored by the World Health Organization. Uh, we were the first state to develop a full plan to be an age-friendly state. And our friends at the uh, Executive Office of Elder Affairs uh, just published the first year report on our progress. Uh, so we're really excited about that. In addition, Governor Baker's Council to Address Aging in Massachusetts published a list of key priorities. And among them uh, is to become the, center of the International Center of Innovation for Technology to Support Aging. Uh, one of the things that we've done around that is to help sponsor uh, a aging focused uh, incubator and co-working space uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, out of the Cambridge Innovation Center that has networked locations across the world, uh, agency and uh, the director of that center and co-founder uh, will be joining us during our workshop tomorrow, Danielle Duplin to moderate the discussion. Uh, among the, you know, as I mentioned, the Health Institute is responsible for helping to support the growth of digital health companies here. There are more than 400 headquartered here in Massachusetts, and more than 50 of them are involved in aging and caregiving. So this is already a significant uh, economic opportunity, and we expect that to grow. And part of the reason why we here in Massachusetts are so focused on aging is that we're one of the older states in uh, one of the demographically older states in the United States. Based on current estimates, about a million residents here are providing unpaid care for an older adult. And this could be a spouse or a friend, but increasingly family caregivers are getting younger. Uh, and in a welcome change up from 40% of future previous generations, about half of millennial caregivers are men. So it's a little bit of background on why the track, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our challenge areas, which uh, are posted also in the participant handbook. So uh, we have three major challenge areas that we're particularly interested to find, hear about your solutions for. Uh, the first is around connections for older adults. Uh, and these are primarily social connection, uh, connectivity, technological connection, but connectivity of all forms for, uh, for seniors and older adults. Uh, many seniors face technology access uh, challenges that can, that can ex exacerbate social isolation. These may be uh, actual access to the technology, but it could also uh, mean that they have uh, challenges, you know, with eyesight or with, um, you know, with their ability to move that uh, limit their ability to uh, get access to technology. That can uh, prevent meaningful access to telehealth. It can limit access to news and critical communi community resources, uh, which can in turn lead to downstream uh, negative health outcomes. So the challenge for you all is, can we broaden that access? Can we help address the bio and uh, psycho and social needs of older adults? 
In addition, older adults are more likely to be vulnerable uh, to unexpected events due to mobility and transportation challenges, hearing and vision impairment, uh, and isolation that hinder their awareness. Uh, can you all design more effective and efficient ways to ensure this population remains connected with critical infrastructure that influences their health, their health outcomes? And in particular, as we've seen with COVID-19, there's been a huge increase in the isolation of our parents and our grandparents, uh, our friends who are older. Uh, we haven't been able to visit them in uh, their living situations. We need ways to keep in contact with uh, these folks, ways to keep families and communities uh, connected and sharing love and warmth. So that's our first section around connections for older adults. Our second is around brain health uh, challenge areas, around brain health uh, in older adults. Uh, for those who may not know, approximately one in five older adults suffer from behavioral health challenges. Most common are mood disorders, depression or anxiety are, are similar ones. Seniors with chronic conditions or disease are more likely to experience these psychological distress. And alcohol and pre prescription drug abuse affects up to 17% of adults over 60 and is often unreported. Neurodegenerative conditions are strongly correlated with age. An estimated 5.6 million people in the US above 65 have Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. We're looking for innovative ways to prevent, detect, and ensure uh, treatment of mental and behavioral health conditions for vulnerable seniors, especially outside the clinical care setting. Most, of, most folks are uh, aging at home, aging in place, either with or with family or by themselves. We need to be able to understand uh, and you know, detect early uh, mental and behavioral health conditions. Can we develop tools to detect pathological movement patterns, biomarkers, or other early indications that a senior might be in distress or experiencing cognitive decline? Can innovation help older adults improve their brain function and support upstream determinants of behavioral health? So as, uh, just as in connectivity, uh, COVID-19 has had an impact on brain health. It's increased mental and emotional stresses. It's particularly without uh, routine social in interaction. Uh, it's heightened uh, anxiety and has, and family members and caregivers of seniors have reported symptoms, have reported increased systems of PTSD and psychological trauma. So we need to, ways to help lessen those challenges. Our third key area of challenge area of interest is around family caregiver support. Uh, for those who may not know, one of the things that has a need, one key sort of determinant of individual health is whether somebody is a family caregiver, has caregiving responsibility. Um, there's a huge caregiving stress has a huge impact on a caregiver's mental and physical health. Uh, and that is an urgent public health need. Uh, by 2035, 17 million households in the US will include at least one person with a physical and mobility impairment. Uh, it's a 77% increase over today. More than one in five older adults will need assistance with the activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, eating, and toileting, and mobility uh, due to health or functioning limitations other than dementia. And by 2030, it's estimated that there will be national shortages of 150,000 paid direct care workers and almost 4 million unpaid family caregivers. Now, there are many technologies available on the market, medical management, caregiving coordination apps, remote monitoring, uh, smart home devices, but you know these technologies are often not well knit together. People don't understand how to use them. Uh, can your solutions hack a smart home to reduce the burden on family caregivers and support elders with, uh, with their activities of daily living? Can you develop solutions that help family caregivers continue to deliver complex care to individuals with serious illness? And again, with you know in the throes of the pandemic, Caregivers face difficult health decisions about whether they're making the right or best decisions for their care recipients. 71% of those uh, taking care of someone with Alzheimer's are unsure what would happen to their loved one if the caregiver got sick with COVID. Many family caregivers are now working at home and juggling their caregiving role with other household duties, such as schooling their children. Can you help design solutions that would help share care more broadly, create broad support communities uh, and, and other support for caregivers and care recipients. So those are our key challenge areas. 
Again, I want to thank uh, our co-sponsor for this track, Benchmark Senior Living. Uh, we'll be running a workshop tomorrow at 2 p.m. to talk in more depth about each of these key areas of interest. Uh, we've got Robin Lipson, the Deputy Secretary of Elder Affairs, talking about, uh, here in Massachusetts, talking about connection and social isolation. We've got Dr. Ipsit Bahaya, uh, Medical Director at the McLean Psychiatrics Hospitals Institute for Technology. And then we've got Stephen Lee, co-founder and president of Ionicare, uh, which is a family care caregiver support company. And thanks to all of you for spending a weekend uh, hacking medicine and particularly Im imagining the future of aging. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what you invent over this weekend, and even more importantly, I'm interested in seeing which of these dreams turn into companies that can grow up and make a real difference in older adults' lives. And as those companies grow, I also hope that you, uh, you build them here in Massachusetts. Uh, we have resources, uh, we have the resources and ecosystem here to help you grow that company, and sort of my day job is to help make this the best place in the world to start and grow a digital health company, and so I hope you turn these great ideas into actual companies and rely on and come to me with those companies. So uh, thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to uh, Tanya and the team and uh, good luck. Great, thank you so much, Lawrence. Really appreciate you laying out the challenges, especially for the future of aging track um, that Mayhee and Benchmark have put together. And uh, as a reminder as well, so Sanofi Genzyme is also one of the co-sponsors of the Aging Track, so they are working together um, for this track. Our next keynote speaker um, will actually be through a video. Uh, this is Julie Smith. Julie is an experienced leader in strategy and product management at the juncture of healthcare delivery, clinical informatics, and software development, focused on improving healthcare through information technology. She brings over 15 years of clinical and informatics expertise to the national and international stage, where she guides product development for InterSystems Longitudinal Health Record, serving some of the largest healthcare organizations and government-sponsored entities in the world. Her passion for making a difference in the lives of patients and strong leadership skills has led to numerous accolades for her team's operational execution and their ability to leverage health IT to solve real-world problems. She served as a judge for the 2019 MIT Grant Hack. Prior to coming to InterSystems, Julie led strategy and development teams for some of the largest health IT vendors in the country. Her clinical work as an emergency room nurse has focused around safety net populations and disaster relief. She has bachelor's degrees in nursing and communications, as well as a master's degree in health informatics. We'll go ahead and play her video now. Hello and welcome to the MIT Grant Hack. My name is Julie Smith. I'm here with InterSystems to welcome you today. And I want to start by telling you a story. Last year, I received notice that my elderly aunt, Alice, had called emergency services on me after waking up in the night confused. She lives with my parents, but they were traveling at the time, and she was being cared for by a caretaker. I raced to the airport and arrived at her bedside that afternoon. And this is what I found. Modern technology allowed for my mother, who is also a nurse, to be on speakerphone throughout the ambulance ride, including speaking with the emergency department attending physician, despite the fact that she was, at the time, in rural Cambodia on a task. And the caretaker was faithfully at her side through the ordeal the care team at the hospital was following established care pathways for my aunt's condition, and everyone was doing all they could to help. But we learned that to decide on care interventions, the emergency department team urgently needed access to an MRI done two months prior in person from an outside facility. The caretaker did not have access to any of Alice's records, and Alice was too confused to give assistance. And this is what I also learned. Alice had not made it upstairs on the day prior. And that led me down the road of questions. How do we think about our aging population? What are our expectations for their care? If Alice's deterioration has been caught, 
sooner by simply monitoring her gait, her speech pattern, her sleep. Was it even reasonable for my parents to have traveled? Should the caretaker have done more? What about my partner's grandmother, who lives alone at 104? What about COVID? Does it change things? How can we think differently about care? For many years, I've practiced as emergency room nurse and faced questions like these daily as patients would walk, get wheeled in, or sometimes even carried through the door. As a hospital administrator, I think about the hundreds of lives filling our units in our care. As a systems leader, that number would go into thousands. In the health IT community, the opportunity is to reach millions or billions. And inner systems plays a key role in reaching towards solutions. Inner systems is actively chosen not just to sponsor, but to work alongside you over the next 48 hours to address healthcare challenges. Healthcare is hard, but opportunity is rampant. We are in our fifth year of partnership together because we know you can change lives with the ideas and innovations spawned. And we know what we're talking about. Intersystems technology supports 58% of total hospital beds in this country with over 2,300 electronic health worker instances, over 8,300 clinical information systems, 90 million records within regional information exchanges are sitting within our systems. We cover the country. We don't just cover the country, we cover the world. We work across 80 countries with our customers who have scaled up and today more than a billion healthcare records are managed by solutions built on their systems. No other company can match that depth and proven experience. And we have the tools and the expertise to connect across any system. And one of the reasons we are so successful is that we know what it's like to deliver care. During the current pandemic, our office in Italy assisted a conversion of a local clinic to a 51 bed hospital in a week. In Australia, we built a new lab interfaces to support testing across multiple regions. In the UK, we assisted with standing up the Nightingale sites with medication control. But it's also personal. A colleague in our Italian office worked every weekend as an ICU nurse as they reach their peak. Two of my UK counterparts returned to practice in the NHS to meet needs. Closer at home, our CMIO picked up extra shifts at the Brigham to cover emergency department needs. And when I think about my own practice, I've answered the call to support disaster relief on a number of occasions. As I watched Hurricane Sally and then Beta hammer the Gulf Coast, I'm reminded of standing in East Texas Rural Community Center with 300 plus military cots filled with lights flickering, people crying, and me wondering, what do we do if the oxygen runs out? You see, I was manning a medical evacuation zone where fragile and at-risk members of the community were being housed. This was hundreds of miles from where the hurricane path was supposed to be, only for it to change directions and for us to take a direct hit. These were your neighbors, your family, your friends. You require a little bit of extra care. Oxygen, nebulizers, strict medication adherence, seizure precautions, falls. Here I was, me and one other clinician, with a closet full of sample medications donated by the community, responsible for 300 lives in the midst of hurricane. And inertia was not an option. How do we come together? In that instance, we created buddy systems for active monitoring of every person in that room. We pulled together resources 
whether oxygen concentrators, blood pressure cuffs, plugs, to use them where they're most needed. We leveraged expertise for people who knew technology to be able to download apps on their phone to figure out what the, the handful of pills were that one of the members of the room might bring forward. As we worked through that together, a couple of days, and FEMA arrived. They evacuated the entire population to a more stable environment. So what a difference 48 hours can make. You are the next line of interviews. What problems are you tackling? What questions are you answering? In the era of COVID, and assistance with the need of medications in the UK and lab processing in the far reaches of Australia, my team has worked to create accurate, healthy data available in real time across this country. As our population ages, what tools might the other one need to support their care? And back to Alice. Alice had a window of 48 hours to get her MRI results to determine her path for the rest of her life. And her sisters had 48 hours to stand up new lab interfaces to meet the community needs for COVID testing. And as I stood in that rural community center, I had 48 hours to keep 300 plus lives safe. This is your 48 hours. What are you going to do to make a change? I can't wait to see the results. Okay, thank you to Julie and to Inner Systems for that inspiring video and those words. Um, so Inner Systems, while they aren't officially part of a single track, they're actually sponsoring a cross-track challenge, um, the Inner Systems Healthcare Technology Challenge, which is a prize that can be won by any team in the hackathon. Um, and the details about that will be on our, is in our participant handbooks. So you'll be able to see further details about that. And so that wraps up all of our keynotes for this evening. We hope that you enjoyed them. And the next thing that I will start going over um, is a little bit of an overview about what hacking medicine is and what to expect for this weekend. Um, before that, I'd like to thank all of our sponsors once again for all of their help in conceptualizing the hackathon, the tracks, and for the special prizes that are being offered this weekend. So what is MIT Hacking Medicine? Our mission is to democratize healthcare innovation. It's to infect, energize, and empower a diverse global community in healthcare entrepreneurship and innovation to scale medicine to attack and solve healthcare problems. So MIT Hacking Medicine has pioneered the healthcare hackathon model. When we traditionally think about hacking, we think of you know, someone in a dark room on a computer trying to gain unauthorized access or to break into a system. But hacking in our world is a creative application of ingenuity to be able to change the system. Our hackathon, um, when you put the words hack and marathon together, is what we get for this weekend. It's going to consist of a lot of teamwork, um, innovation and entrepreneurship, as well as a lot of intensity. You guys are going to be working very hard this weekend to come up with the problems and solutions to try and tackle the biggest problems in healthcare. And we believe that you guys can do it while working together in an innovative way. Our healthcare hackathons are not like other hackathons that you might have attended, specifically tech hackathons. There are four main reasons for this. The first is that there's no need to code. The second is that they're interdisciplinary. We bring people from a wide variety of backgrounds. And we also have problem-centered focused work that focuses on real user needs. So for example, we have patients come in, we have mentors come in with real problems to be able to present to our participants. 
And finally, we really focus on the feasibility and business viability of the uh, hacks that come out of this weekend. We want to make sure that you guys have the tools and the ability to move forward with this to make these ideas a reality. We have brought our model to over 30 countries in the world, working with partners all over the world to be able to encourage healthcare innovation within their spaces. And our impact has been very widespread. Through the past four years, we have had companies, 40, over 45 companies come out of our hackathons. They've raised over $175 million in funding. They have gone on to VCs such as Techstars, Rock Health, Y Combinator, being able to get funding. And more importantly, they have affected real patients and started real clinical trials. And that's what we really are looking for, for you to make a real change in the healthcare space. And while we have had a lot of different successes um, in the time that we have been active, one of our greatest achievements, I believe, is that from our first hackathon, um, there was a company, PillPack, that started, and they were recently acquired by Amazon. And I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about them recently. So now that you have a little bit of background of, about what we try and emphasize within our hackathons, um, I'm going to give you a preview of what our healthcare hackathons actually look like. As a disclaimer, a lot of these pictures are taken from our in-person hackathons, but we have tried really hard to make sure that we translate that over to the virtual space for all of you to be able to get the same experience. The hackathon process consists of about six steps. The first is that all of you participants have the opportunity to go up and pitch about problems that you are passionate about and want to change within your track. After that, you will mix with individuals within your track over Slack to be able to talk to others and form teams centered around real problems. Throughout the weekend, you will then hack on the problem to think about what this, who the stakeholders are and how you're going to come up with a solution. You'll also receive feedback from individuals such as mentors and the hack team. You'll iterate upon your ideas. And then finally, at the end of the hackathon, you will present to the judges in a three minute pitch. So I'll briefly go over these um, slides, but essentially the next thing we're going to do after we break from this kickoff is that you're going to go into your respective tracks, into a Zoom room and pitch ideas. This can be any problem that you are passionate about within healthcare that you would like to work on for this weekend. After that, as we mentioned, you will go onto Slack and start talking with other people who are equally as passionate about the problems that you would like to work on. And from there, you will start mixing and forming teams around these problems. For the rest of the weekend, there will be a lot of ideation going on. So you're going to be hacking around the problem and we have provided a lot of resources for you to be able to think and break down the problem such that you can come up with a solution and business model that will be feasible to be implemented after the hack. You will also receive feedback, as we mentioned, from mentors and from the MIT Hacking Medicine team to be able to pitch your idea to investors in the future. There will be a lot of iteration that happens. Very rarely is it that the first thing that you come up with, either the problem or even the solution, will be exactly what you go with for the rest of the weekend. And so there, make sure that you're open to change and open to changing your ideas. And finally, at the end, there will be a three minute presentation that each team will give within their tracks. They will present to about five to seven judges within the track. And from there, we will decide on first, second and third place winners. So to break down the process once again, we wanna make sure that from the start, you're identifying the problem. The problem is really the crux of the hack that you're going to be working on this weekend. You're going to then break that down, then brainstorm and iterate upon it over and over again, such that you're able to come up with your final solution and business model. We have a couple of things that we've learned over the years from different participants, and we'd like to pass this wisdom on to you guys. The first is that we'd like to have you guys open yourselves to crazy ideas and also leave job titles at the door. At this hackathon, we all have our experiences and expertise that we bring to this, but it's really the collaboration that's going to result in a great solution. 
We also encourage everyone to seek diverse teams. The most innovation happens when we have individuals who are from the healthcare space, from the tech space, designers, uh, people who are in entrepreneurship and business, all coming together to form a very robust team. We'd also like to encourage you guys to reach out for help. If you find that there's something that you're struggling with or unable to figure out, please reach out to our mentors and to the MIT Hacking Medicine team because we're here for you guys to support you. We'd also like to encourage you guys to fail fast and change. If you find that you're going down a route and it doesn't seem to be really panning out to you, for you, um, don't be afraid to just ditch it and go on with something else. It's really that failure that you learn from and that you can create the best solution from. Make sure that you focus your problem. We find that with certain problems, if it's too wide, targets too large of a patient space, it's hard to come up with a solution that's going to work the best and also to prototype in the future. And therefore, we encourage you to really focus on a particular group of people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in the problem pitch sessions. And finally, we encourage you to build something. Show the judges that you have worked on something over the weekend and that you have even mocks to show. Again, it doesn't have to be something that's coded up. Just show that you have an idea of how this is going to go to market after you're done with this weekend. We also have a couple of things for advice of things not to do over the weekend. The first is to worry about patenting. This isn't necessarily the end goal of this hackathon. We really wanna make sure that you're focusing on the problem and solution and iterating upon that. Ownership, the discussions of ownership can take place after the hackathon for sure. Um, right now, we just want everyone to be collaborative and work together. We also would encourage you to not develop too broad of a solution. This ties into this idea of a very broad problem as well. Um, if you come up with a solution that isn't going to suit the narrow problem that you have focused on, then you're not going to be able to have a solution that works well for that population. Try to shy away from being negative and also being shy. Feel free to express your opinions, um, but also make sure that it's, it won't lay, lead to the detriment of the team. Try not to monopolize the conversation. Have your team members have equal say in everything that you guys are working on. And make sure that you are taking action. This shouldn't just be talking about what an ideal world should be. It should be, how can we take concrete steps to try and solve these problems? At the end of the day, when we're looking at what a good hack is, a good hack is based on a good story, meets a real need, can be iterated, can be tested, and can be scaled to work with multiple populations. And so that's a general preview of what our hacks look like. And now I'll go into some more general information. So as I mentioned before, there are four main tracks within our grand hack, customized cancer care, digital clinical measures of activity, future of aging, and access to healthcare during COVID-19. All of you should have received your track assignments already. And if you are logged on to Slack, that track assignment, A, B, C, or D, in the order that's appeared here, um, will show up next to your name. So make sure that if you do have any concerns that you're contacting anyone who is in your track. So there's a, a few important deadlines that you should keep in mind moving forward with this weekend. Um, we'll make sure to have all of these within our participant handbook and all communications that we send out. But so right after this, at about 8.45, 8.50, we'll have problem pitching. We're able to pitch the problems that you guys are interested in. On Saturday at 9 a.m., we'll have a brief kickoff to just talk about the schedule of the day. At 10 a.m., we would have a team formation deadline. And so we um, encourage teams to generally form by tonight, but we want to make sure that teams have formed by 10 a.m. tomorrow and are also starting to think about the problem that they want to work on for the weekend. 12 p.m. is the team registration deadline. We'll have a form for that that we're going to send out. And at 7 p.m., we're going to have practice pitches that will be led by the MIT Hacking Medicine team members where we can give feedback on any draft pitches that you guys have made. We'll also have a session of practice pitches on Sunday and your final presentations will be due at 12 p.m. on Sunday. All of these times, by the way, are in ET. 
The final pitch presentations will start at 1 p.m. on Sunday, and we anticipate that um, between those, the length of those presentations as well as the judging, that we're going to have our final prizes uh, presentation at 3.30 p.m. These times may be flexible on Sunday, so do bear with us um, as we figure out the exact timings. So as I mentioned before, all of our communications are going to be taking uh, taking place over Slack. We'll be posting all of the announcements um, through our announcements channel, as well as through the track channels. If you have any questions, please feel free to um, ask the questions to the organizers in the channel that's specific to organizers. We also have a layout of the Slack channels, as well as all other details for the weekend in our participant handbook. Um, we also do have a participant portal. I believe at the moment that some people have been having some trouble getting onto it. Um, so don't worry, we have put all of the information possible within the participant handbook as well, and we'll make sure to disseminate it over Slack. Over the weekend, as I mentioned, you have the opportunity to get feedback from mentors. And so the way that we have facilitated this is through a mentor queue. If you go to the website here, starting tomorrow at 8 a.m., you'll be able to submit a ticket to be able to ask mentors questions that you have about really anything related to your problem, solution, and business model. We have a guide for this in the participant handbook as well. As a preview, um, as you're thinking about how to structure the problem that you'll be working on, this is the judging criteria. So our judging criteria focuses on four main, uh, four main areas. The first is the impact, making sure that you have a real problem, potential for widespread impact, and that your solution addresses the identified problem. The second is innovation. You want a convincing rationale for why the solution will work, that we address the challenges specific to stakeholders, and that it considers the user experience, interface, and service design. The third is the business model. You want to demonstrate that you have a good plan to be able to work in the field, and that you have a sustainable business model. And the final is going to be judged on your presentation skills of your pitch. So the effectiveness of your presentation, as well as the diversity of your team and the technical expertise of your team, if needed. As a preview as well, these are the prizes that are going to be offered through uh, at the end of the weekend. So we have the four tracks and within that we have first, second and third place, which get $1,500, $1, $1,500 and $500 respectively. We also have three, um, three special prizes that will be offered by our sponsors. The first is the Intersystems Healthcare Technology Challenge. The second is the Brigham Health Poppy Prize for best innovative hack to improve lives of people with opioid use disorder. And the last is offered by the PathCheck Foundation. And so I'd like to thank you all again for showing up to this webinar and our kickoff. We really hope that you have appreciated all of the keynotes and um, the words from our sponsors. And we look forward to seeing all of the great ideas that you come up with this weekend. Again, feel free to message us over Slack if you have any issues. And in about 15 minutes, we're going to have the problem pitch session start. Thank you.